אנו מכריזים בזאת על טדקס בי.ג.י.ו. Your daughter could study anything, either humanities or sciences. But I advise her to take humanities, since it will be much easier on her. So said my high school teacher to my mother in front of me. Easier. That was exactly what I had to hear in order to decide right there and then that I will take sciences. The science class was small, only 22 students, whom just two of them. were girls. Margalit, her mother was our chemistry teacher, and myself, the daughter of a social worker. Were we the only two girls that could have taken sciences? Not at all. But the other girls didn't have a role model like Margalit's mother, and they certainly didn't have my rebellious, adventurous genes. At 14, I was already sure that I will be a genetic researcher. I was really fascinated by the human cell, and especially during cell division, where pairs of chromosomes exchange parts with each other in order to, so said my biology teacher, increase variability in the world. I was determined to find the secret behind this really, really amazing explanation. At the end of my biology uh, studies at the university, the first year, I decided to switch into medicine. My mother was at all not happy. She maintained that medicine is a very tough profession on a woman raising a family, and that biology teacher get vacations that really caters to the needs of mothers. Hearing her, I knew that I had made the right decision. Still, how many young women make their career choices based on society's expectation that are based on the precedents that they have to cater to their quote-unquote natural role as wives and mothers. I didn't realize that I was a feminist. In fact, at the time, I even didn't know what feminism was all about. I was making my own choices. I did what was good for me. I was very much engaged in clinical research, in studying, in teaching, in medical academics as well. But then, when I was a pediatric resident, I first recognized gender discrimination. A colleague, more than 10 years older than I was, shared with me her frustration over not being promoted to a professor, while at the same time, much younger and less academically accomplished male has made it very easily to professorship. She was denied again and again based on the excuse that her CV was not ripe yet for promoting to associate professor. I'll tell you, I was furious. I called the chairman of the promotion committee at the medical school, and I asked for a meeting. And I showed him there her CV, because previously I have noticed that it wasn't really ready and ripe for associate professor. It was, in fact, ripe for a full professorship. So I showed him the CV. He glanced at it, and he said, uh, well, I'll take care of that. But nothing happened. So about a month later, I called him again, and I told him that this was gender discrimination, and that I'm not going to let the issue go. So what did he say to me? He said, Rivka, you are a very promising young faculty. Don't let feminism ruin your career. This particular story actually had a very happy ending, with my colleague being promoted to associate professor in a record time, and I was realizing that I was a feminist. No, I was the same person. I was the same person striving for equal opportunities, equal rights, But I did realize and understood that apparently, when you are asking for those rights for half of humanities that are women, you are a feminist. Well, if being a feminist was acutely aware 
of the obstacles, both physical and emotional, that women are encountering during their career, then yes, indeed, I became a passionate feminist. Not the one that burns bras, but one that nevertheless is very much committed to the cause of equality in general and women equality, wherever they are, and especially in academia and medicine. So I was a pediatrician, a neonatologist, a medical geneticist with a syndrome, a genetic syndrome to her name, obviously a full professor. But when I dare run for the deanship of the medical school against four male candidates, I was first a woman whose skirts were too short. So said one of the very senior professors, hinting that I wasn't fit for the job. And believe it or not, he said that I slept my way through the right beds in order to get to where I was. And I'm sure some of them have heard this kind of saying about successful women. Well, I made it to the deanship after a very fierce campaign, really very fierce, with three male candidates. Only against the advice of my colleague, I put women promotion on my 10-item list for a vision document for this position. Because if you are a woman that makes it to the top, you should actually work your way very, very meticulously to make sure that women get equal opportunities and that they encounter their obstacles and that they get the women-friendly environment in order for them to thrive, in order for them to bring out their whole potential. You should provide those women a role model, but you should also work very, very hard, and I promise you, really hard, in order to make sure that we are catering to those obstacles and to the needs they have. And only this will enable them to really fulfill what they can really do. And they can do a lot, because this still cannot be taken for granted. It is a male-dominated world, and women that made it to the top should really take the lead and change the rules. A year into my time as a university president, I met with the uh, chairman of the Planning and Budgeting Committee of the Council of Higher Education. I asked him to address the issue of the small percentage of women in the academia, and especially in higher academic ranks, in face, by the way, of their equal representations at the undergraduate and graduate student body. He looked at me and asked me, Rivka, do you think that we have really dealt successfully with all the pressing issues of higher education in Israel? I said, no, but this was certainly one of them. I'll tell you, his smile was a mixture of empathy and pity as well. So he waited. I waited until it was my time to become the chairman of the Committee of University Presidents in Israel. In that capacity, I could no longer be ignored. And the issue of women promotion in academia was set as a long-term goal by the Council of Higher Education with various projects to be implemented, with various goals to be achieved. And what is more important and very important, a line on every university operating budget, making this topic a legitimate one to address and act upon. So, with all that has been achieved in the world, landing on the moon, cracking the DNA code, the computer, the cell phone, AI, you name it, women inequality still remained an unintentional reality. It was calculated that it will take 38 years for gender equality in an evolutionary way. You just wait and see, and it will happen in 38 years. Can we allow the world to deprive itself from the contribution of women's talent, great talent, to every field and aspect of life? The answer by both women and men should be an unequivocal no. But the burden and the responsibility 
of always maintaining this topic on the agenda is the sole responsibility of women who made it to the top. Thank you. <laughs>